Previously on the Jay and Dan podcast. Mm-hmm. We took staff to Regina, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary. Duffy's not doing that. Mm-hmm. We're no. showcasing our country. That's we don't right. leave our country. Duffy's betraying our country. Mm-hmm. Hotels.com might be taking a bath on that room so that you can take a bath in that room. <laughs> mm-hmm. And a new extension just opened up and it ends five minutes from my house. I have been watching the construction of this highway forever. Mm-hmm. Today was the day. I hopped in the car. They're like, that, is this like Christmas morning to you? I was like, giddy. You were excited. Mm-hmm. Popped down the highway, but to get on it, the cones are still up. They had to have like an opening ceremony, so I didn't get to drive it yet. Mm-hmm. We got a pizzeria coming in. No name pizzeria or big chain? It's called like Wackies or something. I don't know. <laughs> They're putting in the ovens today. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's Tim. Tim showed up. Oh. Okay. Well, you didn't show your face. You're listening to the Jay and Dan podcast. Wackies. Dance. Dance. The name of that pizzeria? Twisted. Tony Twist. He owns it. (laughs) That'd be a good name for pizzeria owned by Tony Twist. Was it Tony Twist I ran into one night like five years ago? And he's like, remember that night uh, uh, we had in like London or something? I'm like, I've, we've never met. Mm, and yeah. he, was, he was adamant. He's like, no, nope, we spent the I'm like, I, no, I've never yeah, spent. Yeah, but you've had a few nights. No, but I would remember Tony Twist. Mm, in London, though? But how you would have been tri- with me, too. How many triple G and T's had we had? Man, man, the GNTs are good in London. You would have been with me. No, London, Ontario. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were talking about London, England. Nah. Oh. London. I've only been to London twice in my life. I was with you both times. Yeah. That's so maybe you're right. I don't think we have met Twister. So that's been Twist Talk. Twist ties. We tied a bow on that one. Have you been to more cities with me than anyone else? Oh, for sure. For sure. (laughs) Yeah. In this country, definitely. No question. I don't... Well, yeah, because even my parents, we didn't travel that much when we were young. I guess we went playing hockey as a kid. Went to a lot of small towns. That doesn't really count. So cities, yeah, 100%. Oh, those tournaments, though, when you'd go oh, and you'd man. take over the, the floor of a hotel, the mini yeah. sticks going on, and the parents, don't come in here! Like, all the parents just boozing it up in the oh, hotel. Yeah. <laughs> and just, you can imagine owning a hotel and having all those kids, and then, like, what would be, why would you ever do that to yourself? Hey, it's, go to that business. Those rooms are full. Oh, God. And then there was always the hockey bag room. That's right. That They never get that smell out of those walls. <laughs> Oh, my golly, Jesus. Just put that one in one of the smoking rooms. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they have smoking rooms anymore. I was uh, listening to the uh, Conan podcast. John Mulaney was on. Love that guy. He said he's a smoker. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's certain people you just would never pl- uh, peg them as a smoker. And that is one of those guys. That really surprised me. If you want to see great stand-up, watch John Mulaney stand up on Netflix. It is it is top notch. He is, and as Conan pointed out, he's like from a different era. He's like from the 40s. Yeah, they were talking about their shared family history, both Catholic, both kind of had uh, parents who were sort of old fashioned almost. Mm-hmm. Like the world that they were experiencing outside of their homes was very different than the old fashioned Norman Rockwell like world inside their homes. Probably much like our upbringings. You had a very. Uh, old-fashioned type upbringing, a lot of uh, farming, a lot of farming, a lot of fiddling around the kitchen table on a Sunday, a lot of a uh, lot of hoe downs. <laughs> come on, it'll be fun. Dancing with the, the pigs would come inside. You'd allow the pigs to come inside, and then you bring them up on their hind legs, and you dance with them. River, river time. <laughs> hey, Mulaney did say something, and I, I wonder if you picked up on this too. About uh, when, when someone says, oh, I really liked your special. And then he's always like, oh, thanks, thanks. But he's, he now actually takes that in and says, 
I really appreciate that because we have people come up to us and they say, hey, we watch your show all the time. We grew yeah. up with him. We're, and you kind of feel embarrassed. You, you just say, oh, thanks. Really appreciate it. But then I stuck with me. I'm like, yeah, he make, makes a good point. Yeah, you have to appreciate that kind of thing. Today I was at a restaurant having lunch with a friend and the waiter right away was calling me Mr. Onright. And my friend who I went to college with, she was like, how do you know that guy? I'm like, I don't know that guy. And I'm, I said, I'm pretty sure he... He knows me from TV. She's like, so he just sees you on TV and then he just calls you that? And I was like, well, I think it's just like a, it's like a courtesy thing. It's like really nice. I, I said it makes you feel like a regular or something like that. She just could not wrap her head around that one. She thought it was an invasion of privacy. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you're giving them death glare like, you better call me that. Oh, I loved it. I, I just love that. that that's, that's one of the perks of the job. And as we've pointed out, I, again, and by saying this, putting it out into the universe, this means it will happen at some point, and then I will regret even mentioning it. I've never had a single person come up and say something negative to me, to my face. Lots of people on social media, lots of people have said, I don't like you. I don't like the way your face looks. Why do you dye your hair? Uh, yeah, but, that was the latest oh, one. Someone ooh. sent you a full email saying you should stop dyeing the hair because you're not fooling anyone. The part I didn't include in the, uh, if you follow my Instagram stories, I put my reply to him. What I didn't include was that he also said I dyed it in three layers. It seems very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Who would ever do that? Boy George in the 80s, maybe? The strangest one I ever got was when I first started on TV in Vancouver and someone sent me an email after I was on air for like six months. They're like, hey, I noticed <laughs> I noticed you fixed the left side of your face. <laughs> Can you tell me what you did? Because I need to do it as well. <laughs> it has changed my life. <laughs> that is hilarious. So I'm like, so I start looking in the mirror. I'm like, what was wrong with me? Oh, my God. Was I drooping? <laughs> Old droop so too. And that's when I was young. You know, I was like... Uh, my whole life ahead of me. Did you have uh, a stroke? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh God, that would be tragic. And now, City TV Sports <laughs> with Droop So Tool <laughs> and Monica Deal. Yeah, Monica Deal, she had a great gig. We did the 11 o'clock news. She came in at like 1045. She, what a stunning woman. Was she tall? She was, seemed like she was tall when she did Electric Circus and all that. Everyone seems tall to me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she was very tall. Very that, nice, very nice. That would be a great title for your book. <laughs> Everyone seemed tall to me. Yeah, that would be an awesome title. And I used to fool my kids. I didn't say I was tall, but they used to think I was tall because they were shorter. Now my uh, youngest, or my oldest daughter, Sydney, she's over five feet. She's creeping up toward you. But sh the scam is over with her. She's like... Yeah, she like, knows. Yeah, she's like, you, you aren't you aren't tall. I'm like, well, I'm average height. I'm average height. She's like, no, you aren't. Five, I'm eight like, and a half. I'm we like, measured you. On, yeah. I might have been on, no, it wasn't on the podcast. It was on TSN radio. We were filling in on the radio for James Sabalski. Remember that, Kristoff? I do, I do. It was our first time working together. That's right. And, uh, and we did the measurement. And we did it twice just to make sure. Bang on, five, eight and a half. That's right. Absolutely. No, it was five, nine and a half. No, five, eight and a half. I was no, I'm five, nine at least. I'm 5'9". No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold on. No, no. You're, this is revisionist history. It was for sure 5'8 and a half. You've always yeah. said that, 5'8 and a half. I've always said 5'9 and a half, so I'm lying? I think so. Hmm. I think you're giving yourself an extra inch, which we've all done. <laughs> Believe me. Hey, I I've given myself a couple. I recommended, um, our guest just got here, I recommended that John Mulaney special. I sent you a clip of another show I highly recommended, uh, Mike Tyson Mysteries. Maybe the greatest show on television. Well, let's bring Gary Roberts in here and see if he's a Mike Tyson Mysteries fan. Gary Roberts, everybody. It's easy to consume. It's 11-minute episodes, and it is purely brilliant. How are you, my buddy? How are you, buddy? Good to see you. Come on in. Have yeah. a seat over here. Have a seat right over here. Yeah, we're already, uh, we're already taping. It's happening. I'm I great. How say, are you doing, Gary? I always envisioned meeting you in person and wondered how jacked you'd be, and the answer is completely jacked. Like completely ripped. I'm back to the way I was when I played junior hockey. <laughs> In the end, fat. I. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, how, how are you? Doing? That's the leg, don't you? Well, I, look at me. <laughs> is that special workout water, or is it just regular this is water? Special water. Yeah, it is. It is uh, Dolomia. 
or Dolomia, or however you want to say it, if you're Italian, I guess. <coughs> they okay. bring it in from Italy. The wow. Italian Alps. Oh, really? And, and that I helps? I drank it out of the spring uh, probably now five years ago now. Wow. And went down and did a deal with the company, and they send us over over water. I'm trying to, you know, evolve, and I'm a bit of a green guy, so. Right, right. We buy a lot of glass, too, but it's no different than anything else. It costs money to get it here. Right, right. But we use it for our program. It's amazing water, high pH, uh, helps guys recover. Have you ever had Orno tap water? <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I what about Witty yeah. tap? That's <laughs> good water. Oxbridge water is actually pretty good, so <laughs> I could probably move on from that. <laughs> it seems like a lot of uh, trouble. A lot of work. For uh, <laughs> just to hydrate uh, Phil Kessel. Well, that's why we're a high-performance <laughs> program. How much we water should we it. be drinking today? I Stop see people at the gym. Oh, yeah, you can. You yeah, can my hair is better. You don't have I to. I don't have to. No. Wreck my hair. Yeah, that's right. You look fantastic. How you, much? You wa- literally have not aged. Well, you have not. not aged. My wife cleaned me up today and got rid of some of the grays. So, you know, I'm like you. What, right? she yeah. shaved you? Well, no, there's you know, a little dye, you know. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so I look good. I mean, you guys look good, Gray. I mean, not so much, but. What are you talking about? You look fantastic. I'm okay. You, how much are you actually working out yourself? Like, just you, because you're working other people out, but just what about you? I would say for me, I, uh, I still skate twice a week. So I skate uh, Tuesday mornings with a bunch of alumni and some young guys that push us up at the NTR rink in Newmarket, uh, owned by Wes Jarvis and Mike Gardner. And, wow. and we do that on Tuesday mornings, and it's a good skate. And then I skate Thursday nights with a good group of guys in Stouffville that my brother organizes a skate there, and there's some good young players out there. So huh. I get two skates a week uh, in the winter, and then I try to do like three or four workouts on top of that just to, do it. Just to kind of stay in it. You right. Know? Like I'm not breaking any records anymore. But right. Just trying You're maintaining. To, yeah, I'm trying to – well, I'm trying to practice what I preach, was, yeah. which is a you know, healthy lifestyle. So – you know, I've always been that kind of, you know, that guy. If I'm going to preach it and I'm going to, and, and I don't mean preach, but, you know, if I'm going to speak of it and yeah. and and uh, make people believe I understand what I'm talking about, I better at least look the part, you know, far from game shape, I say, but right. but still okay. Um, <laughs> does uh, our camera guy, Dean Willers, take part in either of those skates with you? He used to, but he, he took so many slashing companies. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, slashing, <laughs> hooking. He was one of those guys who just say, he's just trying to get a piece as you go by him, right? So you, you could be like, you know, dripping blood from the eye. So we had to, we had to cut Dean from our skate. Dean, oh, he's a legend. He's he is a great, great guy. We always enjoyed having Dean out uh, to skate with us, but we haven't seen him lately. He must be really busy. He actually does. He, I think he might be at the World Juniors with in the Czech Republic with those yeah, guys. We've, right we've now. spent a couple Olympics with that. Guy. Oh man! Yeah, he'll, uh, he'll if keep you ever you want time. to go to the Olympics, go with Dean Willers. Yeah. He bring his hockey stick with him. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty Protect much. You guys. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Hey, so tell you got uh, something going on you want to promote. I wanted to mention that well, before I forgot. A, yeah, we have a, a deck the quads uh, I love challenge that, that we're doing um, for Jumpstart. Jumpstart CCM. We're raising funds for for sporting equipment for kids that that, uh, that can't afford it. Uh, so we're we've got a program that we put up. Uh, every Monday morning, 500, and, which is inclusive of 500 lunges per week, and we're trying to raise those funds, obviously, to to uh, help kids play sports, which is uh, obviously a passion of mine and and something that I believe has given me everything I have in my life. So anything we can do to help uh, young young kids get out there, uh, our youth get out, be active, uh, be involved in any sport, any activity. Then we try to do that. You know what's what great about Jumpstart? Every cent goes into the program For because sure. uh, all the overhead is covered by uh, Canadian Tire. Yeah, and, and we have uh, Pat Higgins is our is our local uh, Uxbridge Canadian Tire, and he's a big supporter of uh, Jumpstart and and my annual golf tournament that we do. All those funds each year that we raise at the golf tournament in August also goes to Jumpstart in the Durham region to help uh, to help our youth uh, pay for pay for sports. How do people get involved with the Deck the Quads program? How do they do it? Well, they go on and... Uh, on to your website? Yeah, or on to our, our uh, Instagram. Okay, yeah. They can find us on Instagram, and they uh, basically, uh, if they donate over $75, they get, a, they get a nice pair of training shorts from Adidas. Oh, oh boy. Cool. That's and, decent. Um, so we're, we're just trying to uh, yeah, get it out there. And also, it's the training program, right? You get basically... Uh, a free training program. We've put some thought into the programming, so you can actually use that programming 
uh, to continue your your training after after the Deck the Quads campaign is is over after Christmas. That's awesome. That is actually fantastic. I love that you put thought into the actual program itself. Well, I, have I a, guess you can't just do anything half-assed, can you, Gary Roberts? Yeah, like <laughs> I, I always say, like I just I think I keep my team small. I keep my my program pretty small. I think it's an elite program, and and I always say that uh, bad reps are for daycare. Right? So nice. we, we nice. don't do a lot of bad reps at the Gary Roberts program. Um, can we get back to Canadian Tire? Do you ever just go to Canadian Tire, walk around? I, I love I, that store. I do go around Canadian Tire. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and I, I usually have my dad with me when I, when I need to really buy something. Right? My dad's like, okay, dad, we got to go over here and buy some stuff to fix something. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I used to take my dad again. when I really need help at Canadian Tire. Is it true that you, I always, always under the impression that you, because you played lacrosse and you were a great athlete growing up in Whitby, I was always under the impression you were always in great shape. But in fact, I read that Badger Bob Johnson was the one who sort of, saw you early on when you were yeah. with the Flames and said, uh, you're actually not in good, you need to be in better shape. Yeah, and I He was think, the one. Yeah, and I, I, th- I came into the NHL, uh, so I was an eight, 1984 draft pick. So think back to 1984. Like the, that's when the training camp was where you got in shape yeah, for like, some guys, right? I would right? say the Calgary Flames were ahead of their time there. They had a, young, a lot of college players and some, and some veteran players uh, that were very fit. So, right. So I played lacrosse and I played hockey. I didn't weight train. Right. And it wasn't really part of anything I was part of. I, I played for Brian Kilray in Ottawa. Um, you know, he fired my good friend Lauren Goldenberg because he thought, you know, we were doing too much off ice training and wow. we were wasting practice time. So That's amazing. Brian Kilray said, okay, enough of running stairs, guys. Get on the ice. We can do that stuff. So I wasn't really a weightlifter. And I went to Calgary and I got involved in all these fitness tests. And I am asthmatic. So I go to Calgary, first time ever at, at high altitude in my right. life. The only thing I think I'm going to do really good on is a, is a two-mile run, and I have an asthma attack in the two-mile run. And then I'm going to do the strength test, which I've never really done much of, and I fail all those tests. So, you know, Badger Bob in front, I think he used to have like 70 players at training camp back then. He stood up and said, uh, basically, our first-round draft pick was our worst condition player at camp this year. Wow. So I always tell people. That must have been fun. Yeah, I always said, like, <laughs> if you could beam me up at any time in my career, that I was sitting in a room in front of 70 players and basically got called out in front of 70 players that I was the worst conditioned player at training camp. And that left a huge mark on me, right? Like, I, I was either going to quit hockey or I was going to come home and, and get on a program and start training. And, and it still took time after that, but the next year I went back Badger Bob Johnson followed me around every test. Hmm. And I can remember going to uh, Audrey Bakewell's power skating at a university uh, in Calgary. Um, and I bring in a chin up bar with me that I put in the doorway. And every time I went through the doorway, I would do chin ups. Because it was, I, it, was the, it was the worst test. I think I did like one and a half chin ups at my first <laughs> training camp. That's now, like, like me. So, so I got, I got like, you know, I was either going to go home and quit hockey, yeah, or I was going to learn. Oh my gosh, there's a lot more to playing hockey than just playing hockey. And I had to become very fit, but also because Calgary Flames were way ahead of their time, they had amazing veteran players that that, I, that were very fit. I walked in and saw guys hanging from chin-up bars with plates between their legs doing pull-ups, and I'm like, where? where Who's am doing I? that? Otto? Where am I? <laughs> like I remember a player by the name of Dave Heidmarsh. I walked in and I remember him. The first guy I saw was doing plated, get a knee brace on, and he was doing weighted uh, pull-ups. Jeez. And um, and Paul Baxter, Tim Hunter, Doug Risebrow, Lanny McDonald, all these old-time players. They were a very, very fit group. Hmm. So it forced me to to get my crap together. Uh, very early so in my career. So when would they have started that? Like, you think Lanny, you don't think, you think he would have been old school and not doing uh, the off-ice stuff. Talk about chiseled. Have you seen that guy? His I haven't seen him in years. No. His forearms, and we, I still play in the old alumni game with him. He'll shake your hand, and, and your arm goes numb because this guy is still jacked. Love and, it. Wow. Uh, so, you know, that was the, you know, I think of a guy like Lanny who was, you know, there's certain people that come across in your career that are so influential. Uh, Brian Curry, I spoke of, or my early junior coach, right? Like, who would yell at me every day. But, you know, he would say, you know, if I stop yelling at you, kid, it means that I've given up on you. I actually think you can do something, right? And Lanny took me under his wing along with Joe Noondike when I first went to Calgary, and he was such an amazing mentor for Joe and I. 
taught us so much about how to act on and off the ice. So I was just fortunate to come across those people early in my career that I think I use a lot of what I learned from those guys uh, today. I feel like we should get right into this list. Well, I just wanted to ask one question. Um, So you train guys in the offseason, but you played lacrosse Mm -hmm. all the time growing up. So (coughs) what do you say to a a current athlete now (coughs) that is not in junior hockey that wants to train all summer, but his parents or someone else is trying to tell him, no, you don't have to do that all summer. You should play other sports. Because well, that must have been influential. You for, won championships in lacrosse. For sure. And I, and I still, believe me, there's still a part of me that really wants players to be multi-sport athletes for as long as they can. Like, I totally believe in it. I totally believe you become a better athlete by playing other sports. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you have to play rep everything because right. rep lacrosse is as busy as rep hockey. But, for example, our program every summer – our athletes, our players go out and they play a different sport every day as part of their warm up. Hmm. Right? Like whether it's spike ball, whether it's basketball, whether it's soccer, right? We have guys doing activities every day. They're working on their athleticism without them really knowing it. And we do that a lot with our younger players and even our pros. I got to go out to the field sometimes and say, okay, guys, enough of the spike ball. Right. Let, we got to go lift some weights. Right. So, so I'm a big fan of being a multi sport athlete for as long as you can. Unfortunately, now, Today, you're having to specialize much earlier than we used to have to. Yeah, Gretzky talked about that. You know, like he played baseball in the summer, and he's like, I, I, I that's what I want play, people to do. What you just said, literally, literally. So I, I still think there's an element that we, as as adults and as coaches and mentors, I still believe that we need to encourage players uh, to to be as active as we can in other sports. And, and we try to, we try to uh, mimic that in our summer program. Uh, speaking of your program, can we just quickly touch on that? Yeah. Um, you mentioned you try to keep it small. Is it, like, how do you get in? Like, if I, I'm an NHL player and I want you to train me, yeah. is it it's sort of the kind of thing where you have more people <laughs> requesting to be trained by you than you are capable of fitting into the program? Yeah, like, I mean, we, we train out of uh, St. Andrews College, which is an amazing all-boys school in Aurora. Um, but our facility can only handle so many. Yeah. And I've brought in younger players from, you know, 06s to 02s as we, as we do the birth years nowadays. Um, I brought in those younger players to be to also have an opportunity to see what some of the pros do. But I can only handle so many. So when I'm taking a new client, it usually comes a, from a referral from, a, from an agent or from an organization that have asked us to take on this client. And, and many of our clients are local. Right? Right. We're in a market, fortunately, that have a, a lot of hockey players. So I haven't really had to go outside our sport to, to create a business. I, I've had an amazing team. You know, I'm... I'm a big team, like I believe for me, I had a team behind the team that helped me make a comeback at 30, that helped me you know, play 13 more years in the National Hockey League. And I believe that team uh, was so important to, to, to me and to what I do today. I've been fortunate to build a team behind the team. Right. So I have an amazing uh, holistic sports nutritionist. I have amazing head strength coach. I have a speed coach. I have an assistant. Like it's a small group. I have a chef. Uh, you know, athletes care and our amazing health provider that, that gives our players treatment. So I know that I made my comeback because of what I did away from the rink, not what I did at the rink. So I've tried to mimic that and, and give that to the, all the players in the summertime so we can give them the best possible program and the best possible chance that they're going to they're gonna become better players after they've been with us. Now, it's, it's also their off-season. So you've had, for sure, a player come in hung over to the gills. <coughs> Correct. What do you do to that person? Do you single them out and say, okay? Yeah. <coughs> no, usually we do a jump test. We believe in weekends being about recovery. And we know everybody's young, and we, we, we understand. We just ask players. We don't want to hurt anybody. So we'll ask players, listen. How'd your weekend go Monday morning? <laughs> and we can tell usually because we do a jump test that, that basically gives us a measurement of how well they recovered over the weekend. If they were drinking all weekend, then the chances are their jump test is going to be very poor. And then we say, hey, listen, you haven't recovered from the weekend's a nice way to say it, to a new client. Uh, go home, drink some water, have a sauna, get some sleep, see you tomorrow. 
If you if it, every Monday morning you jump poorly, <laughs> yeah, chances you got a problem. Are, that'll go about three. Uh, I'll probably give you two passes, and on the third time, I'm like, okay, kid, you're not getting any better if you're out all weekend. Uh, and I'll be honest, I haven't really. We have the odd time, of course, because players will actually come to us and say, hey, listen, I had a tough weekend. I had a wedding this weekend. <laughs> yeah. I was up north with my buddies on the boat. You know, my jumps are going to suck today. Right. And we're like, okay, man, good. And just we're going we're gonna to give him. We don't send him home usually. We give them a recovery day, right? And we're right. big on recovery. It's part of our philosophy, and we'll give them a recovery. We'll give them a recovery workout to just get a sweat and get through the day, and we won't do anything uh, too severe that they risk hurting themselves that day. We should. I think we should start. So we have a list, an incredible list here of players you played with, coaches who have coached you, and players. I mean, most of these guys you're currently training. So I actually want to start with the players you're currently training. Okay. So maybe I would say the most famous one you're currently training is is Connor McDavid. So we just want to get a few words from you about all these people we're going to be mentioning. Or a so short story, with, whatever. Any, literally short story. Anything. Well, here's when I start talking about a guy like Connor McDavid. It's not. It's a really long story. <laughs> uh, I would just say uh, committed, 100% committed, an amazing athlete and, and person. Um, when did you first meet him? When did he first uh, come to you? Bobby Ora called me when Connor was just going into, he'd just been... Granted exceptional status. Right. That's yeah. a great start to any story. Bobby Orr called me <laughs> right there. So when Bobby Orr calls me, I was, it's like when Bobby Orr called me, I was like, okay, I, I, I got to get this, right? <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, I'm going to send you this young player. He's, he's 15 years old. He's going to go play in the Ontario Hockey League. Um, don't hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> Be so gentle. I remember going into my team and I said, hey, guys, we got this young player that, you know, Bobby Orr always says, like, People thought I was the greatest sk skater ever to, to skate. Uh, Bobby Ord told me that this player was going to be the best skater ever to play. And Connor McDavid was 15 years old. Wow. Well, Bobby Ord obviously saw it. And then when Connor walked in our gym, I knew he had a really special, special uh, person. Um, very, very shy, very, very, very quiet. Uh, just, just uh, I would say... Um, very, very green, and we just, we just, you know, obviously took care and and progressed them very slowly for the first years, and just tried to um, listen to Bobby Orr and make sure that we put him in a position to succeed every year. So, is it a lot of squats with him because he has a gear that no one else has on the ice? I would say it's it's really the consistency of his program since he was 15. You know, we don't, you know, people will call and say, "I want the." you know, Steven Stamkos program. Well, right. you don't just get the Steven Stamkos program. You build. I'm a big believer in not skipping steps and everybody's development, and you build. And then we take a 15-year-old like Connor McDavid, and we had a plan for him where we thought he would be at 18 in his draft year. And and we didn't rush that plan. You know, some guys join the program, and they say, well, why am I, why am I not squatting over there? Why am I not doing that 350 pounds or 400-pound deadlift? Well, because you're not capable of doing that. You could probably do it, but you, there's a good chance you're going to hurt yourself doing right. it. So we, we have a player comes in, he gets evaluated, he gets uh, tested, and we have a system. You're graded, here's where you are. You're a, you're a C plus, right? Or you're, this, is your, this is your level of experience weightlifting. We, you're in a certain category. And you work through those categories till you, till you get to be you know, a Steven Stamkos or a Connor McDavid. And I know Connor last summer, or maybe even two summers ago now, I remember getting a call from Brian saying, you know, Connor's pretty happy today. I said, why? He said, well, he, he trapped our deadlift over 500 pounds. Today, oh, and wow. he never, ever thought he would, never, ever thought he would do that. Right. So it's kind of cool little stories along the way. And, and I think for me, you know, just seeing players' successes for me is what, what, motivates me to continue to do what what I do and what our what our team does and you mentioned Steven Sam because I think that's a player that you're famous for having trained and for having turned I remember him coming into TSN when we held the draft lottery here and shaking his hand and so he's obviously 18 or 17 yeah. at the time and I was like this guy has a handshake like an Alberta farmer now like it was really <laughs> intense yeah, yeah. Gee, this kid is tough like like so obviously you were it was paying off what you were doing yeah and I think he for him he uh you know he's had some challenges along the way that have that have you know given him uh trouble too right he had a 
he had a broken broken leg. He had the blood clot. He had a he had a torn meniscus in his knee, um, and he's had some challenges. No no player goes through his career without having those challenges. But yeah. a guy like Stamkos, who who is just such an amazing human being, uh, I, I I would you know love this kid like he's my son. Uh, I was he, I was forty uh, two years old. He was eighteen, and we were line mates. And wow. uh, for me, right, I had uh, such an amazing year with him. I was brought down to Tampa to spend that year with, with uh, helping to mentor Stammer along with Mark Recchi. And, um, and we had an amazing year uh, hanging out with Stammer. And mm -hmm. uh, he was over, you know, all the time uh, hanging out with, uh, with, my, uh, with my son. And, and uh, we just had a... You know, a bond and a relationship, and and for me to to watch his successes and and uh, be part of that, and watching him grow as a player and, a, and an athlete and a person, has been uh, very fulfilling for me. Okay, let's dive into uh, <clears throat> your career. Wait, wait, we have to do one more. Okay. Just one more, because and it's not on here, but um, because we've talked about the elite level athletic ability of <laughs> Connor and Steven. And then there's another person that you train that maybe isn't known so much for that. And his name is Phil Kessel. Right now. How did Phil now? There's always a joke about Phil on the hot dogs and everything. Yeah. But <laughs> how did he come to you? And I'd love to know your personal experience with Phil. Training. Well, we love him. Well, I would, well, I love him too. <laughs> and I've, but I've learned to love him. You know what I mean? Like, uh, Phil has learned, um, you know, he came to us when, when he went to Pittsburgh and, and I was actually working for Pittsburgh at the time. Uh, Jim Rutherford said, you know, we really would like to see you go see Gary Roberts in the summertime. And I'm sure Phil was reluctant to it at first. Um, as a Leaf, I never worked with Phil. So he came the first year and, uh, and it, was, it was a work for us. It was right. trying to get used to what Phil... You know, we realize right away, he is a very competitive guy, and and he is an amazingly powerful athlete that people really didn't give him credit for, right. and you and you would never have known. Of course, you see him skate, and you you know he has some level of power. Right, and you see the shot, his shot, and yeah. his skating, and and his and his ability to to pass the puck. You know, he's a great a great great player. Um, but I would say over the years, he wins the Stanley Cup, his first year with us. Uh, wins the Stanley Cup the second year with us, right? And and uh, so so I then obviously like I'm I'm texting him in like June because he's not texting me. Right? <laughs> I'm like Phil, when are you? When where are you? Are you? Where, where, are you? where are you? When are you coming back? He says, Ah, the golf course in Florida cl closes July 4th. I'll be over. In, I'll be in July 4th. But but the truth is like, you know, I kid around a little bit about that, and that's him. But that's his personality. But he is so much fun when he comes to my program my staff love him the the players that 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 enjoy being in the gym with him you know but he'll he'll be looking like he'll have a 300 pounds on him on a like a, a single leg rear foot elevated split squat with a safety bar and uh someone will be yelling whether it's james neal yelling usually at him down at the other end of the gym and he'll actually turn and talk to him while he's squatting this 300 <laughs> wow. plus on one leg and I'll be looking at Phil and like, Phil, can we focus here for a couple <laughs> seconds so he don't, you know, this doesn't drop. Um, but he's learned to, he, he's, well, I think he enjoys the program. He enjoys that we're, we're serious, but I recognize it's the summer, like, like Dan mentioned, right? It's the summer. It's got to be fun for them. It's yeah. got to, it can't be an environment where people are yelling at them. And everyone's We've, different. Everybody's right? different. Some yeah. guys need to be yelled at. Yeah. Right? James Neal needs to be yelled at. Yeah. Right? Does the real yeah. deal get a yeah. whippy discount? <laughs> he, he doesn't actually. <laughs> he's so much. He's so much work that he actually pays me more. But he's always <laughs> smiling though. Yeah, so he is. He yeah. is. He's a sweetheart. But uh, but I think for me, I think that's the environment we've tried to create. We tried to create an environment for athletes that's that's very positive. And it's and it's very relaxed, but at the same time, there's that element of seriousness each and every day where we're we're working and, and getting better. And I've, I can say that uh, that the that whether it's the my strength coaches, our chef, uh, the, the 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 therapists, uh, I've tried to create a real real uh, uh, you know environment that's that's uh, that players want to come back. Players, yeah. I had such a great time last summer. Like we are dialed in. We're dialed in on the food. We're dialed in on the recovery. 
Yeah. It's all part of it. When you join our program, you get the it's whole all, program. It's all I'm sold. Yeah, right? I'm sold. Yeah, do you, you got to train the Dan. Athletes. Like, like we have some young players that have evolved over the years, and I think being around Stephen Stamkos and the Connor McDavid's and the Tanup brothers and uh, Tierney, Shore, Anderson, these players that have been with us a long, long time, we've created a little family environment there that the players uh, genuinely in, enjoy uh, pushing each other and coming back and to coming, every year and coming back and getting yeah, yeah and, and becoming better yeah uh, so it's been fun for our our whole group and team to you have to, to, uh, we have to i have to give a quick shout out to sylvie who works and she trains my wife she, does. Me, uh, she is uh she is a machine she's the yeah. fittest person in my program perfect sylvie. So why wow. you on the judging program, by the what? judging by the check I just wrote to her? <laughs> <laughs> I can't we I can't you, dispute Sylvie. that. We I love can't you, Sylvie. That. Sylvie is the yeah, she's the rock for our program. You'll have to um, get me a program I can do at my fit for less. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, fit for less? I think we've, we've got seven <laughs> weights. <laughs> they go up to thirty-eight pounds. <laughs> well, we can uh, we can just lunge, drink water, and lunge. No, I, I asked the, you the top. The how much water should I? Regular human be drinking. I would say, uh, truthfully, like two to three liters a day if you're not active. Okay. Is that you? Not active? No, I'm uh, active. I work it every day. Do you? Yeah. So, and I say to my athletes, if you're if you're if you're very active and you're a sweater, some guys are real sweaters, some guys aren't. I would say four to five liters a day if you're a real sweater. Oh, so, that seems like that's a lot. lot. It's a lot of going to the bathroom. <laughs> it seems like but a yeah, lot of being. You get, but your body gets you know adjusted. Like I probably drink at least at least ten of those in a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's. Right. You always talk about your dad being on the farm and I probably working drink all too much water. Yeah, my, my dad wife would... always thinks I pee out my vitamins. That I drink too much water, which. <laughs> My dad would work right, in the field all day at the farm. He'd come in, have one glass of water, and go back out. I give my dad a bottle like this, 500 mils, yeah. and, and I'll give it to him on Friday when he comes out of the house to watch minor hockey. And on Sunday, it's like still not fun. And I'm like, Dad, Dad, you haven't drank 500 milliliters of water all weekend. And so, yeah, my dad's, my dad's very similar to that. And I'm yelling at him every weekend. Okay, we got to go through a little bit of your career here. Toolsy, I'll let you. Okay, we got to start to, in Calgary <coughs> and um, Mike Vernon. Yes, my roommate. Oh, really? really? Yeah, okay. we were roommates. I always got to room with the goalies for some reason. I had uh, Rick Wamsley. I had Wammer. What a guy. Well, yeah, I had some great roommates early in my career. I had uh, Matthew Kachuk was texting me last night because he was out with Mike Vernon last night. They must have been at a function, a flame function, and Mike right. Vernon was there. And he just sent this note that said, beauty. <laughs> right? uh, so we always joked around. I said, well, that, that, I said, well, say hi to Mikey for me. I said, he used to go run and get the ice for me for my cold bass on the road. Wow. Because I, I would do cold baths on the road, you know, I was, and that was in my, you know, my, uh, my late 20s. And uh, Mike Vernon used to get the, and then he said, well, yeah, after Rob sat in it, I used to put my beer in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike Vernon was a great roommate. He took good care of me. Took good care of me. Um, so you mentioned Lanny. Um, I, I, there's one I want to <laughs> ask you about. You guys got him in a trade. John Tonelli. Like, talk about a hard worker. <clears throat> Oh, he was, yeah, for me to have a guy like John Stanley come to Calgary, um, those are the kind of players that, that uh, were having, had such an amazing career and were so, worked so hard every day and were so professional. Uh, I, I just remember uh, how good a guy he was and how well he treated the young players. Like We had a lot of veteran guys in Calgary, and I think our, our young players really benefited from having guys like John Tonelli in the organization early in our careers to see the professionalism that they carried each and every day how about al mckinnis did he dial back the slap shot in practice he did he did he was so good <laughs> at like he could shoot it so hard though and he was so accurate you would never know it like looking at his curve you'd think oh my gosh you know the odd one would get away i remember but uh <laughs> uh he was he was an amazing amazing uh, d-man amazing shot uh and the same thing like he was hard on me he was hard on me early in my career, as, as I think he went through a bit of a tough time with his fitness his first year, too. Um, so I would say he wasn't my, my, my best friend early in my career, but I definitely learned to, you know, we still, we still talk to Calgary guys. So Vernon, Neuendijk, Suter, uh, McInnes, uh, you know, we were considered at one point in Calgary, we were considered the, the couch. 
You know, and you guys must have owned that we, town. And we always, <laughs> once in a while, we get this group text going. So the crazy <laughs> thing is that we, some of us get it, some of us don't because we're so, you know, uh, you know, techno- technically, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, not not up to par on our on our phones. That right, we're like, right. did you get that message? We're like, trying to, <laughs> we're losing Texas, and we're like, oh, okay. I love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you guys still do? Uh, do you do alumni stuff with the Flames? You, you played for a bunch of teams, so yeah. there must get so many There's requests a, to go to a different places. Yeah, I would say. I've, I've, well, usually it's Calgary. I try to I try to do Calgary um, stuff, uh, a little bit of Toronto stuff. Uh, I try to do a little bit, but I think with my business and with my kids, right? Like I have three young kids at home, so yeah. I have an older daughter, and then I have, I have a nine, ten, and fourteen year old. So I'm I'm busy, busy guy, yeah. and uh, so I I don't get to do as much alumni stuff now, especially with my boys playing minor hockey. Um, I was lucky, right? Uh, tonight's a, tonight's a good night because it's usually a quiet night for me. Right, right. Uh, now we appreciate you hanging with us yeah, for a little bit. So. Uh, okay, how about um, let's go to where are you going now? Should we stay in Calgary or go to Carolina? Let's go to Carolina because I okay, well, I just realized you played with Jeff O'Neill. Yeah, oh we got to bring up uh, <laughs> O-Dog. Is he here working out somewhere? <laughs> Do you guys have a gym I in this place? He's no. Oh in, is he in the gym ne- right negative. now? Negative. Did you at any point playing with him? I remember when he first appeared on TV with us and I said, I told the story a million times to Mark Millier, who was our boss at the time, uh, you've got like the next Charles Barkley on his hands because unlike most hockey players I've met, this guy really does not give a about what other people think about him. <laughs> Are you like yeah. to say the F bomb? Oh yeah, yeah. We, ble- wow, we bleep it out. Been, yeah, yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, <laughs> Jeff O'Neill is just one of those guys that he's never changed. Right? He's always had that personality. It's not like he, he just we woke up and acts like he does today. He's acted right. like that his whole life. <laughs> right? Like, and I think that what makes him uh, so authentic is that he actually. He doesn't really change for anybody. He is who he is, and uh, on a on a serious note, I'm really proud of him. He's done a. Uh, we all struggle to find something in our life after hockey that's that's meaningful, and and you try to find a near niche, per se. Uh, I'm really proud of him for for what he's for what he's done and how well he's done uh, here at TSN. He really has found a, a nice a nice uh, life after hockey, and, he, and he's very good at it. He really is. So How about... Um, just working on his fitness, well, that, <laughs> that kind of dropped off after we weren't teammates yes, anymore. I think so. How about Arturs Urbe? Uh, is, Archie. Is it oh, possible to have a short conversation with Arturs Urbe? <laughs> a cobra. He used to poke check because us in practice, right? He, he, was, was, telling us, he <laughs> was telling us the history of hockey when we ran into him in Russia. He was like, well, it all started... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he did like to talk, <laughs> but uh, he used to. We used to get mad at him because he would literally poke check us in practice, and he was so good at the poke check. You know, he called it the cobra, and he would just <laughs> dart out in practice. Meanwhile, you know, you're not really expecting it in practice. Next thing you know, you're on top of him inside the net because you crashed, <laughs> right? Uh, a great, great goalie too. Right? I think he's found a way to to have a pretty good career. Oh for, yeah. For uh, for a, a smaller goalie, um, but his exceptional work ethic, exceptional work ethic. Um, Paul Maurice was <laughs> one of your coaches there. Yes, right? he was. Yeah. Paul Maurice was. Um, so back, like we always talk now, like we think if we if we were actually talented enough to be players, that would be the coach we would want. He just seems like he <laughs> treats people with respect. And was he always that way? Was he? I, I would say he was. I I uh, obviously was making my comeback in the NHL at thirty. So I would have taken any coach. I was just happy to be back playing. And he probably wasn't much different in age than you. No, we're about the same, very yeah. similar age. So, so I remember getting to Carolina, meeting Paul. Uh, I think I, what I loved about Paul Maurice, um, and I would say he's one of my favorite coaches that I ever had in my, in my career. Uh, he was just very, very uh, in- inclusive. I would say he had a veteran, used his veterans for feedback. Uh, we would have regular veteran uh, meetings, and he'd ask uh, what what we thought as, as far and not that he did everything we said, but right. but we had a good group down there. Ronnie Francis being part of that group, and Glenn Wesley, um, 
So we used to, uh, we just have lots of conversations with them. And do you guys need more in practice or do you need less? Hmm. Uh, how, how, you know, and we say, hey, I, I think the team's tired. We need a day off. Right. You know, or, yeah, we're not skating that hard in practice. need to do more. And he was just really good that way. And I, so I really enjoyed Paul Maurice as a coach. And, uh, and I would say, uh, you know, and, and under the circumstances in Carolina, he did a great job. And it's nice to see him having his success. The, his practices were great. I just remember how hard his practices were. And I love the pace of his practices. And I bet the Winnipeg Jets feel the same way today. Yeah. Now, let's go to another coach uh, in Toronto, Pat Quinn. So, Pat, uh, for me, uh, we always appreciated uh, his leniency. Like, he was a burly, like, when he spoke in the dressing room, we were all, we were all listening. Uh, but he gave, a, gave us some freedom to be creative on the ice. Hmm. And, you know, I remember my good friend Brad McCrimmon, right, who's no longer with us. Uh, love him to death and miss him every day. But Brad McKimmon used to call me and he'd say, Jesus, you Leafs, you guys are so tough to scout. He said, from one line to the next, I can't figure what the hell you guys are doing. Interesting. Because we had uh, we had some freedom. Pat right. gave us that freedom. You know, in the end, we probably didn't really win because we didn't have enough structure. Right. Hmm. And we lost in the games against Jersey and right, Philly. Right. That Those were, teams that had really structured. They really structured yeah. and were tough yeah. to play against hmm. and really tight offense. Interesting. Like, we used to kid around, like, hey, boys, like in the dressing room, we would say, hey, boys, make sure Eddie, make sure Eddie gets at least 40 shots tonight. <laughs> right? Because he plays his best. He plays his right. best when he gets 40 shots. Yeah. Or Cujo. Right. Make sure Cujo gets 40 shots. Like if Cujo, if you look at it, Cujo have anything less than 30 shots? He didn't have a good game. <laughs> So we used to get, we used to love giving breakaways to teams and two on ones because <laughs> we used to be creative, but we yeah. turned pucks over. But Pat gave us that license to be creative, and I think we, that's why we in those years were we were a really fun team to watch. But if you're a scout like my good friend Brad McCrimmon said, I have no clue what you guys are doing. So in a way, it was a benefit that we played that way. Mm. Uh, but in a seven game series against t- teams that are quite a difference like Carolina for example yeah uh, they we end up, end up getting beat because we just we were a little too free maybe and, and eventually it cost us uh, but but uh, I, I appreciated Pat Quinn a lot you mentioned Ed Belfort why don't we lump in two of the goal <laughs> so Ed Belfort interesting character and Tom Barrasso yeah I was so excited to ask you about Barrasso <laughs> because he <laughs> well I'll be honest you know what he I, was I, one of the most hated guys in the NHL yeah yeah I think you know you come across goalies that were a little different and I would say Tom was probably different <laughs> Uh, I, I would say I didn't really spend a lot of time with him, and, and, and to get to know him, he was, you know, he was later in his career too. We had a lot of guys coming to Toronto. Like I look at some of the teams that yeah. I played on. And just we started names. adding Ronnie Francis in Toronto. We Doug Gilmore came back yes. for his last game. We had Glenn Wesley come up from Carolina, yeah. right? Like Jeff O'Neill ended up being a Leaf the year that I yeah. left. So Brian Leach, Brian Leach, <laughs> like all the I'm like did, Owen Nolan. Owen Nolan, Nolan is Nolan. on that list. Like, yeah, they, they think Travis guys, Green. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I met you know, all those players that have come through Toronto. Yeah. Um, you, you're like, holy crap! Like, did we all, did we really all play together? It, it is actually <laughs> How did amazing. How they never win with that group of guys? I, I That's just, what I would say. And yeah. I was just gonna say that, Gary. You know, you look at the names on the, and then we didn't even mention Sunday, and we didn't mention Caberlet. Like, well, they were lifers here, so you, we didn't have to mention those guys. You, but. Yeah, you you guys had McGillney. Like, you oh. guys had some really amazing talent. Oh, one of the funnest guys I played with was Alex McGillney. Like, you talk about not giving an F. Like, he just, <laughs> like, I remember walking in the room one day, <clears throat> one day and I'm like, we used to call him Elbow, and I'd be like, hey, Elmo, like, come on, bud, I got some some treatment guys, right? We can get you healthy. You got a bad hip. And he looks over at me. He's in the trainer's room sitting down, you know, hanging out and not getting treatment. And he looked at me and said, Rob's, 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 just relax. Net, let nature heal it. <laughs> Right? Like that was Alex McGill. Where is that guy now? Well, I don't know where Alex is. Like, who knows? But this guy was. What a Have all the guys though. that played. Well, yeah, like, he could have four pairs of skates in his stall and he would be changing actually brands between periods. <laughs> or he would have one stick that was four to six inches longer than the other. So he says, when my back feels really good, I use the short stick. But when my back doesn't feel so good, I use the long stick. Like, he'll have, like, you know, like. Most of us, if your if your stick's off a hair, yeah, you're right, not, you're not you feel it. He would use a stick four to six inches longer and and, and change period to period. Wow, he was an amazing and and what a still, guy. 
Yeah, he was amazing. He could was an you, amazing guy. Could you see that Travis Green was going to be a coach? I was coach? just going to ask that. I yeah. could. I actually, I couldn't. No, I did not think Travis Green would be a coach. I didn't think he liked hockey that much. He always seemed <laughs> really? grumpy, right? Mm-hmm. He always looked grumpy. He still does. He, he still grumpy. does. <laughs> <laughs> he was grumpy. Maybe that's why he's a coach now. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I would say I didn't think Travis Green would be a coach. I've had some conversations with Travis since uh, he has been in Vancouver and. Obviously, he's doing a tremendous job. He's, yeah. When he went through junior and then on to the NHL, so he's he's put his time in, and good for him. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go to Florida, like a stint in Florida. And you played, So you played with the whole Overdrive crew. You played with O'Neal, <laughs> yeah. and then you played with Noodles Yeah, I played with Florida. Noodles, too. Both, yeah, what a beauty Noodles is. But that's what I mean. You come across some goalies that are a little offside, and I put <laughs> Noodles in that category. <laughs> but was uh, he all – I always just think no, of him a in, a, in a dressing room just being this, like – where are we going tonight, guys? Like, yeah, I always feel he, like he's that he, guy. He, for sure. He was yeah. a very, very friendly, friendly guy. He had a routine like all goalies, but I would say he was one of those players that was really easy to get along with and you enjoyed you enjoyed your time you spent with him. Uh, so, absolutely, he was uh, a good teammate. And, it's uh, like an and, underrated quality to have a backup <laughs> who can, yeah. can play for you. Yeah. And then also is kind of a glue guy in the dressing room for too. sure. And I and I and I've kind of, you know I was fortunate to play like you talked about Mike Vernon, Rick Wamsley, Curtis Joseph. Like there's some goalies that were really easy, easy to get along with, and we're and we're the glue. Like really, we're the glue in in your in your organization, your team. And and Noodles was that guy uh, that guy in Florida. Like obviously Lu- Luongo was the guy, but but uh, but Noodles did a really good job supporting him. Uh, should we move to Pittsburgh? Yeah. Um, you played with Sydney? Well, didn't you know I made Sydney? <laughs> <laughs> he was young, I was old, right? Like yeah. I was 41 and playing with Sydney Crosby. That's I unreal. Line. And I remember going to the rink and I'd be like, oh God, I hope my legs feel good tonight. Because <laughs> he's yelling at you, right? Like, really? Like yeah. he, he wants the puck. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I remember morning skate one day, I was out there cruising around. He's like, Rob Jobs, come on, let's go. And we'd do a two-on-one, and he'd be like a zone ahead of me, right? <laughs> I'm like, would you slow down out here? He's like, come on, let's go. And I said, you know, if I try to skate that fast in the morning skate, I'm not going to have anything left for the game. Um, <clears throat> so, well, I mean, what can you say? Like, I, I had my last two centermen, uh, you know, Sidney Crosby and Steven Stamkos, like I think about having the opportunity to play with those two players, and see the way they prepared, and see the way they, how skilled they were, and how professional they were as young players. Um, I think it gave me a real indication of where the game was going. Mm-hmm. Right. So when I started my program, I'm like, these guys are the, these guys are going to be the greatest players in the game for mm-hmm. a long time. And uh, so it was a real bonus to me to have an opportunity to play with those two players in my career. And Sidney Crosby is a special, he's a special person. And you've, you've seen him evolve because when he first got into the league, everyone got mad at him because he was always complaining to the refs and stuff. He, yeah. he doesn't do that <laughs> yeah. anymore. He's a more well, Don mature Well, Don used to always single out Crosby right? Yeah. because he would he considered him a whiner early in his career. and. And, uh, but you never see Sid like him. I mean, and that's been a long time. He yes. hasn't done that, yeah, right? Of like, course, yes. He is a true professional and he's put up with a lot, a lot of, a lot of crap on the ice. Yeah. And, uh, no player, uh, handles it better than he does today. Um, the way the attention that he gets. And you think about the consistency that he's shown over his career, right? Like, Absolutely. Not, like, not too many players well, uh, the have, fact ever, that have ever done that. Kind <laughs> of similar to your situation where you had a, a career threatening injury, you had to retire mm-hmm. when Sid was going through the concussion thing. Yeah, it turned out to be a neck issue <coughs> for him. Right? Correct. There, there was a time when it was looked like he wasn't going to play. Yeah, he had a tough Did you talk to him yeah. over that period? I, I was part of that a little bit, like, uh, through his time. It was kind of, I was. Uh, Actually, the year that it happened was in the outdoor game in Pittsburgh, and I was playing right. for the alumni that he got, year. Yeah, and he, he got, got kind of blindsided, blindsided yeah. right? Um, was it was a beagle in in uh, Washington? Washington, I think. Yeah. So, anyways, um, so I was there that night, and it was a miserable night in Pittsburgh. It was kind of raining, and mm-hmm. you know, so it was unfortunate fortunate hit that he took, and 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 he went through a tough time for a while. But uh, you know, it seems like those kind of injuries, whether it's your neck or your head. Uh, it just just time, you know. You need mm-hmm. to take the time and and really be careful with it because you see players nowadays uh, 
having reoccurring concussions that are out long, long periods of time. So you want to be careful in your first one that you don't come back too early. Right. Um, we probably should wrap this up because if yeah. we got to go do the TV side, I could just sit and talk to you for hours. Oh, I know. Gary, well, I, about what, this stuff. We have Monday so nights, many guys here. Is it Monday night? Olaf yeah. Kolzig, yeah. Vinny oh, Cavalier, Marty I mean, St. Louis. Gonchar. I, <laughs> I, just, I just talked to you about Gonchar, Gonchar for another, an hour. Yeah, another <laughs> magician. You had Talkin as game. a head coach? <laughs> Great, great guy. I love Rick Talk. He used to come in and his wife beat her and scare everybody into playing harder for him. <laughs> I think he used to do he used to do arm curls and push ups in the dressing when he was mad at us in Tampa <laughs> when he took over like, he'd come in and his eyes were really big and he was sweating and his big bald head and Oh my god. And I used to I used to cry laughing in my towel because he was trying to scare us into playing harder. <laughs> So, uh, He's great, done great. pretty well in, in oh my Arizona. Gosh. For but sure. you know what? I think of that like Rick Talkett. Like he would say, "Hey guys, I'll be at the rink at eight thirty. Want to come work on your game?" Right? That was the kind of guy he was. Like he'd be at the rink. You wanted to get to the rink work early, work on your game. He'd pull half a dozen guys. Whoever showed up, he'd be out there helping you work on your game. Like he was a he was a and he was a head coach. Right? He was did it as an assistant coach in Tampa. And they took over after. After they realized, you know, how bad Barry was. I was just going to say the Barry right. Melrose oh, yeah. experiment. Yeah, that experiment didn't go so well. So, so Rick came in and, and realized that uh, the, the players needed to just have some fun. Yeah. And, and, but, but he made us accountable. And I think that's because his, of his honesty and, and the way that he operates, uh, he, players want to play for him. He yep. was a great player. So sometimes you think, well, a great player isn't necessarily going to be a great coach, but right. somehow he has uh, transcended that somehow. But from what you're telling me, it's almost like you must have known he would be a coach for a guy to just say, "Meet me at the rink at eight thirty like that," like an assistant at that point. You know, yeah, that's like really, gonna be a- really, really loves the game. Really has become, you know, uh, a real, a real knowledgeable teacher of the game, and 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 is willing to put in like he puts in a lot of time. And yeah. as you guys know to be a good coach nowadays. Uh, I still believe they probably put in more time than they need to, yeah. but they they definitely have to know your stuff. You definitely have to be prepared and put your time in. Uh, the game's really evolved, right? And all those things you just said, Barry Melrose didn't do any of them. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> well, Melrose, no. he said, he, he said was, Stephen uh, Stamkos uh, wasn't good enough to be in the NHL. I mean, well, all over Tampa, these big, big, big billboards. <laughs> and he wouldn't Stamkos, play them. He wouldn't Stamkos, play Stamkos, Stamkos, and then Barry Melrose comes in. After two games, we lose in check. 2-1, two, 2-1 one, two, one to the Rangers. Like, pretty good games. He comes out, ah, these guys are overpaid. Steve Stamkos, we need to send him back to junior. <laughs> I remember everybody in Tampa going, did he just tell our first overall pick we've got to send him back? He's not strong enough. But we ended up, that's when our relationship started because we ended up working out. Stammer and I, Rick Talkin came to me and said, let's, let's just get him stronger. And he ended up scoring. Think about that. Like, Barry Marrow has wanted to send him back to junior. And, <laughs> and, you know, and then we end up, you know, training him. I was working with him off the ice. Uh, he was missing the odd game to do off-ice workouts. Wow. To get him a little stronger. He ends up scoring 20 goals from January on. Yeah. Right? And uh, and then I mean, Barry actually, went back to ESPN. I think, he's still I think, there. Didn't yeah. Samer just get his 400th recently? I think so. I think I told him he's getting close to me. I said, I don't part You don't not, like that? They're not counting my goals in beer league anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, he's... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty amazing all the stops you've had along the way. You know? Yeah, so. I think. Uh, well, believe me, I'm uh, I'm so appreciative of what the game gave me. Um, the people I've met, the teams I've played on, I've had some amazing experiences and have made uh, uh, tremendous friendships through the game of hockey. And and I owe it everything I have in my life. Great having you on the podcast. Thank Thanks, you, Gary. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Gary. This is great.